Hey guys, what's going on? So, sorry, once again, just like always, we are a little bit late, and I literally just came from some meetings, and that is why. But, uh, we're going to be talking about pistol upgrades, or not having pistol upgrades, and answering some of your questions. Uh, we're going to try to do this in a little more fireside manner, uh, where we can run through your questions a little more, uh, rather than getting really philosophical on certain things. Uh, we have a lot of different Glocks here, obviously, going over, we'll be going over red dots and iron sights and pistol lights and stippling and triggers and stuff like that. Uh, I also have a bunch of uh, some of the other guns that I use back here, uh, my race gun, M9, other stuff like that we'll probably get out and talk about. Uh, but obviously, we talk about Glocks a lot because, you know, that's what we shoot about 99% of the time. Um, so it's what I basically use for my job, which isn't necessarily something that's you know, um, like I'm not a cop or a mill guy. Uh, Steve here uh, was, and he ran a Glock when he was in law enforcement, and it's obviously the most popular pistol in America for duty use, uh, but also being purchased by uh, regular citizens. Uh, I would say the Glock 19 is probably the most common. And as far as holsters go and the sales that we actually uh, get, Glocks are by far the number one, and the Glock 19 is the number one pistol that holsters are ordered for. Um, so, with that said, um, there's a couple things that I want to go over real quick, uh, sort of c concepts, philosophy as far as pistol upgrades go. So when I started shooting like five years ago, uh, I was going to some competitions, USPSA stuff, I guess it was like six years ago, and I saw guys with really fancy guns running around shooting, and I wasn't that great at shooting. I thought I was, went to my first match, got out shot, placed towards the bottom. I wasn't at the very bottom, thankfully, uh, but I didn't do as well as I would have liked. Uh, so I started doing research on what some of these guys were running, lighting triggers, minus connectors, all sorts of crazy stuff on their pistols, fancy sights, fiber optics, whatever. And I thought, and this is what a lot of new gun owners think, they thought, I thought I could buy performance uh, by upgrading my pistol. So I started going to town, you know, reloading the lightest ammo I could, getting weird connectors, weird stuff, light and striker springs. And what happened is I went to tons of matches and actually had more problems with my guns than I had simply shooting the stage. Uh, light strikes, uh, all sorts of other issues. And after it took me probably about eight months of realizing, playing around with all these different upgrades that, you know what, it's more about simply shooting the gun and building skills without the gear than it is playing with all these crazy accessories. Now, with that said, some of these accessories out there, they really can give you some benefit, especially once you have the fundamentals in place. But going into this live, it is important to note that don't think that you can buy skill with fancy upgrades, with light and triggers, special red dots, you know, crazy stuff. It all comes down to your skill and your performance of simply pressing the gun out, pressing the trigger properly, having good fundamentals, and getting the job done. Is that a crack? No, that's not. Thank goodness. It looked like one on this slide. This is Ev's slide, but it's not. Um, so, Steve, do you have anything to add on that per your experience running pistols, uh, getting out of the military, going to law enforcement, shooting handguns more? Because obviously they don't do that a whole lot in the military. Yeah, um, as, as I progressed, uh, or as I am progressing through, you know, how I look at shooting or how I understand shooting or whatever um i used to get uh pretty pretty hung up in you know what new piece of gear was coming out or what kind of upgrade i needed for my handgun or what have you but didn't really actually see real benefit until uh i put more emphasis on actually training and learning uh what i need to do uh to get the tool to do what i want it to do so yeah uh, so with all that said, let's go over, you have your Glock here. Why don't you go ahead and go over your Glock and have it set up. I'll go over mine, and then that will definitely spawn probably a lot of questions as to what we have. And Chad, it's really awkward having you behind the camera because I can see. Just kidding. It kind of is. I just, I just had to pick on Chad. His head's literally in line with the camera, and it's awkward. <laughs> well, it um, makes it easier for me because now it's just like I'm talking to Chad instead of that lens. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, this is my 19X. Um, it has a couple, uh, couple doodads on it. Um, but this is actually what I've been carrying here lately. Um, so the, the add-ons to this, um, the first thing I did was I had a different set of sights on here. Instead of yep. using the, uh, the uh, factory sights, which actually the 19X, I believe, comes with iron uh, night sights. So you've got actually steel uh, night sights on this. They were a little thick. Um, so uh, getting elevation lined out um, isn't isn't too bad, but then your windage uh, 
your windage left and right um, when you're aiming with this can get a little little hanky, a little uh, a little bit further out of distance. Um, but I, I kept those on there for a while until I added the uh, the red dot. And honestly, the red dot for this thing um, is more just because it's easier for me to see. I mean, it's a lot easier for me to see the dot than it is to yep. uh, uh, mess around with my iron sight. So I, I prefer having an RMR on it. Um, not to say that I couldn't shoot a gun with with iron sights, but um, it's just it's just a lot easier for me to to aim with uh, and see what I need to see. Yep. Uh, second thing was, uh, actually this is one of the first upgrades I did, is I just I put a weapon light on it. Um, so it's my carry gun, I'd like to have um, a light source with me. Um, having it mounted to the gun allows me to uh, more efficiently use the light um, instead of having it a handheld option. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't be familiar with handheld techniques or not carry a handheld light. Um, but for, for this gun, it's nice to have uh, an X300 on it. Yeah, that's, definitely, that's something that Steve and I did a video on recently, the most important upgrade to put on a rifle. Um, the reason that we say that a weapon light is most important is so that we can simply identify what we're shooting at. Uh, most stuff happens at night. Uh, there's all sorts of situations where you could be in a restaurant, you know, maybe a dark, really fancy, moody restaurant, but it's during the day and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, you need to use a handgun and you're having to see past a lot of different people or try to identify, you know, what's actually going on. And even though it's broad daylight, you're in a super dark restaurant or you're in a store or something. Uh, so our number one upgrade to start off with is a weapon light. Uh, we personally run the Surefire X300. I actually am running a TLR7 right now. Uh, this is the main light that we usually are running. So if I were to go out and buy this stock Glock 19, I'm just going to get rid of that bullet. So if I have this guy right here that I purchased for 550 bucks, whatever it is, the first thing I'm going to go out and buy is a weapon light. Now, there are a couple things to think about. Uh, a lot of people, when they go on, they just Google search pistol light and they get the NC Star and the Nebo and like all these really rubbish Chinese made $30 pistol lights that aren't going to handle recoil. Uh, they don't have very many lumens. They don't have good battery life and there's no holster compatibility. So they go and they buy these cheap lights because they want to try to save money, which hey, I totally get that. Um, they put them on their pistols and then they have no way of really running it and it doesn't really work in the first place. So if you are buying a piece of equipment that you are using to identify stuff and that you need to like hold up and not fail, you're gonna have to spend some money. Uh, you can get a Streamlight TLR1. I don't have one right here. You know, those are like $140, something like that. Uh, are we down? Are we good? You've got like the TLR7, which is what I'm running, which I think is around the same. And then you've got the Surefire, which is like $230, something like that. Uh, so that's something that's really important when you go out to purchase something like this. Uh, like you guys aren't going out and purchase, you know, you're not purchasing high points. I mean, unless you're, you know, doing certain things, but you're not going out and purchasing high points as your pistol because you know you need something a little more effective than that. So why would you go spend high point money on a pistol light that you are then putting on your nice handgun that you have just purchased? It's really beyond me when people do that. And back when I took the email requests for custom holsters like five, six years ago, people would email me with those lights. And I was like, what are you doing trying to get a holster for this $20 light that isn't going to work? and they just didn't know what was going on, mostly because they don't actually go out and shoot. Uh, so that's the number one upgrade for us. Uh, another one that I personally really like to do is lightening the trigger slightly, um, although it doesn't matter too much. Obviously, I run stock triggers a lot. This is stock, he's stock, he's stock, this guy's stock, this is stock, this one's not. So I actually only have one gun here that is not stock, oh, and the one that I'm carrying. Let's go ahead and hit some questions, because uh, we'll, we'll get to this stuff as we take questions, and we'll just handle it that way. And I think uh, when should working. you transition from irons to red dot? Um, cover that. You'll what? cover that. You'll cover that. <clears throat> it's a good one. I don't know. Um, I, I think it's important to, uh, at least with the handgun, I don't know. I'm a little bit torn on this, because there is some, some, some stuff that... Uh, uh, when it comes to teaching somebody, especially a newer shooter, um, about sight picture and how to utilize sight picture, if you start them out on a dot, it's a lot easier for that student to uh, mm -hmm. pick that information up and um, apply it. Yep. Uh, and then going from from that to the irons, I think might be an easier transition for them. But uh, I would say balance cost with that as well. Like you know, if you've got your handgun, yeah, 
uh, and you've got a you know decent set of iron sights on it or whatever, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. It's not impossible to learn you know how to mm -hmm. use use sight picture uh, with irons, but I, I think that's a, a personal personal preference on you know yep. uh, for most people. Now the second thing though is as as you know in law enforcement, some of the older guys that we would see have trouble during qualification or various ranges. Yeah. Uh, we tested some stuff out where we gave guys red dots. Uh, we took some of the instructors' handguns and uh, gave them to students who were a little older and let them run the, uh, the red dots on their, uh, for like a qual or, you know, through courses of fire. And yeah. they shot a lot better. Yeah. <clears throat> I, so what I tell people, because that's, that is probably one of the biggest questions that I get on pistol upgrades is transitioning from irons to dot. And I will say what's really cool with that is when I first started running an RMR about five years ago, there was that question really never came up. Everyone was still saying red dots are dumb on pistols. They're not gonna, you know, it's not gonna be a thing. They're not good enough yet. They're too expensive. Uh, but now we're seeing, uh, you know, obviously a lot of companies producing pistols with dots already on them or selling pistols with dots already on them. And now the question is when to make the transition. People are obviously accepted. Accept, the, the the transition is acceptable to them uh, to upgrade. They realize the future is now old man and um so i think that's something that's really cool but what i tell people is start with irons and spend your money on ammo initially if you don't have the money to go out and blow on an optic and a slide cut and ammo at the same time uh buy your pistol first run it like so buy your bullets later on you can go ahead and add a red dot uh, but i do think it's important that people have an understanding of how iron sights work same goes for carbine uh being able to train with iron sights and principles of marksmanship before upgrading to you know, a red dot or an ACOG or a scope. Um, I think it's the exact same thing with a handgun. I think probably in five or 10 years, we'll start seeing pistols with red dots that don't even have iron sights, but the red dots are so good uh, somehow as far as durability uh, and also battery life that just iron sights will be a thing of the past as far as on handguns. On rifles, we may keep having them. I don't know. You obviously have a larger weapon that has more room to stick some stuff. And weights is not as much of a concern because you're able to sling it and stuff like that. Uh, but I think in five, ten years, we'll start seeing pistols that have the red dots actually built in. That's something I would love to see is slides that actually have the red dot built into the actual slide itself. Now, that creates issues as far as as the technology changes or warranty or maintenance. You know, you're now having to modify the entire gun itself. Um, but right now, it's still a two-piece design. And I'm looking forward to the, to the time when the iron sights are actually built or the red dot is built into the slide, uh, kind of like certain guns out there, like the Beretta, where you obviously have the front sight post that is essentially part of the slide. I'm actually looking forward to when red dots are like that as well. But technology will have to allow for that. So start with iron sights. I would say a good benchmark for that is uh, basically every time I present the pistol, I'm finding my iron sights uh, consistently every time, 99.99% of the time. Um, you know, I can accurately shoot A zones at 25 yards. I can do it pretty fast. Um, and as soon as I've got that down, uh, I would say then you could start thinking about making the transition to a red dot, which will make you a little bit faster, uh, definitely shooting at distance, uh, tracking moving targets, shooting on the move, uh, shooting at night, shooting with night vision. Red dots have so many pros to them. They have way more pros than they do cons. And so whenever the conversation comes up, irons versus red dots, it's still pretty funny to me because red dots really just blow iron sights out of the water. And it's the reason why every rifle nowadays has a red dot on it, not only iron sights, at least all the modern good rifles. Um, so yeah, but definitely know how to use these guys uh, before you actually move to a red dot. I will say the caveat to my statement of, you know, hey, we let them shoot with the red dot, the guys that we test this out, uh, the older dudes, it came down to a seeing issue. It wasn't an issue with their fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Uh, those guys were all uh, pretty solid, uh, had a solid foundation in how they manipulated the handgun. Um, it was just, it came down to a matter of, you know, they were just having a hard time seeing. So the dot helped, helped clean that up for them. So it wasn't like you throw a dot on and magically you're going to shoot better. Um, sometimes I think that's a common misconception. Uh, regardless if you have a dot or not, you still have to... Yeah, got to press the trigger properly. Yeah, apply the fundamentals. If, if you don't press the trigger properly, it's like 90 whatever percent of missed shots are due to trigger management. It doesn't matter if you've got, you know, a $200 Hollow Sun red dot on your pistol or a $800 endpoint T2 or stock Glock irons. Uh, if you suck, you suck is really what it comes down to. So it all comes down to trigger management, but your sighting apparatus definitely helps uh, we are doing certain things. So there's a couple of questions. I'll run through a couple of these that I'm seeing. Um, someone's asking about the P3, P365 bullseye sight. Uh, it's 
interesting technology, but it's still not there as far as being a red dot. It's basically a bright, luminescent dot that's built into the slide. It's kind of a hybrid situation going on there. Uh, and then they marketed the pistol as being a no-snag pistol because there's no iron sights. And it's like, well, no, iron sights like this aren't really going to snag on anything. They don't really snag on anything. Uh, something like a suppressor height sight like this, that could potentially become an issue in certain bags or drawing it from a certain kind of holster. Some but, of the really taller ones. Yeah. yeah, but marketing a normal pistol mm -hmm. not having iron sights as like it's not going to snag because it's you've taken a couple you know millimeters off of the gun. Like it's not really... A, it's kind of a moot marketing point, in my opinion. Uh, someone said adding pistol, uh, custom pistol grips on pistol is dumb. Not necessarily. Um, I don't think there is necessary. It also depends on the gun. I don't think it's as necessary as some people think. Uh, I did change the grips on my uh, new CZ75 because the, the fat grips were, uh, they were preventing me from getting the mag release as consistently as I would like. So I went and bought some super low pro slim grips to actually go on that gun so that I could actually hit the mag release uh, every time. So that was a performance mod, an in intuition mod that I made to actually run the gun more consistently. Uh, but whether you choose like Patchmar or Ivory or like whatever medium type of grips you're gripping isn't necessarily going to magically improve your shooting. Uh, making it in such a way you can actually hit the mag release You've got extended mag releases like this. So for people that may have small hands, they're having to really twist uh, the gun in their grip to hit the mag release. Having a larger mag release can help with that. Um, it's not necessarily going to make your reload super fast or perfect every time, um, but it can help you, you know, get to the mag release and be more yeah, consistent. That's that's, that's why important. I switched this out. It was it was not because I wanted some fancy mag Jay release. Mag releases. Uh, this is the older one. This is the nice one. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't like it was because I, I, with the way my thumb is, it was extremely yep. difficult, no matter what I did, to reach it. I'd have to twist the gun like this just to reach the uh, the mag release. Now, I will say, when you're doing stuff like this, I found out the hard way, you got to be mindful um, of how you move, especially like if you're in kit and you have a uh, drop leg. Uh, I squeezed through a small port in an attic uh, one time, and uh, as I was coming back down out of the attic, I had holstered it got down out of the attic and realized there was no mag in the gun, so I had to have one of the guys get back up in the attic, feel around at the at the exit there, and uh, I had Check bent in a certain way that it actually disengaged or engaged the mag release. Yep. So you gotta, the mag. definitely got to check your holsters as you're playing with your mag releases and make, make sure your holsters to begin with have clear mag releases. Uh, back in the day, holster companies used to think it was cool to have them covered, uh, but that actually usually caused more issues where as the gun would flex and bend in the holster, uh, the kydex or the plastic material would actually hit the mag release. Uh, so we clear all of our mag releases out and we try to leave enough room that even if you have an extended aftermarket mag release, even if the gun is flexing in the holster, um, you're not going to lose your magazine and all of your bullets and be stuck with one and have to play one in the chamber, which, you know, as you guys, you Call of Duty players know, is really hard. Uh, trigger spring upgrade kits. Uh, they can be good. You probably... So one of the big ones that people try to do or do is they take the New York, what is it, the New York uh, spring, trigger spring, Glock spring, and they add that inside the, uh, the what's it, the big plastic thingy-majig, trigger housing, and they do that to improve their reset. I've done that, and it's just, for me at least, it just created uh, a less consistent trigger that was a lot heavier. Um, I personally prefer just running, if I don't, buy a drop-in trigger that is like an all-in-one drop Completely safe setup, set up. Uh, and I use the tactical trigger, I just shoot them stock. And after you shoot 10,000 plus rounds through your stock pistol, it lightens up to like five pounds instead of five and a half. But stock triggers also on Glocks especially, they're not all the same. Like they don't all break the same. Some of them have more mush right, right when you get to the wall. Some of them are six pounds instead of five and a half. And I've had a couple guys tell me that they're not all perfectly drop safe. There's a failure rate on Glock stock triggers where they're not actually all necessarily drop safe. Um, so I don't necessarily want to throw them around all the time, you know, obviously chambered, because I may have a lemon that's not actually drop safe, and that's just due to how the trigger works and everything going on inside of the gun. They obviously mark it as being drop safe, and the majority of them are, uh, but I had an aerospace engineer who actually re, uh, re, he pulled it out to reverse engineer it and was like, yeah, I, out of all these triggers that I tried, there were a couple that actually weren't drop safe. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. But everything has a failure rate. That's just how it is. 
Uh, show your 34 with Trigger on. Yeah, so I'll run over this real quick. So this is the main gun that I've been running lately. So this is a Zev Dragonfly Slide. They don't make this anymore, which is one reason I kind of like it. I like things that is, aren't made anymore because it's kind of fun. You know, nobody else can get it. Well, you can. You can go to eBay and buy them or whatever. Um, got a Trigon SRO on here. One reason I like mm -hmm. the Zev slide, so the issue with the SRO is because it scoops up in the front here, uh, generally what happens when you put this on a normal milled slide is it sits up really high and it looks kind of awkward with this little, little scoop in the front. Uh, something I really like about the Zev slides is they actually position the RMR much lower in the slide. So for the SRO, it works perfect. It's right up close. The only downside to this really, and the SRO in general, is the glass is so close to the ejection port that I have a lot of carbon that actually, you know, as I'm shooting and running the gun, it actually starts to form up here on the glass, which you don't really get on an RMR because it sits back further from the ejection port. But as you can see here with the SRO, it's literally right up here on the ejection port. Uh, and if you, if you don't wipe that away and you don't clean it, it actually kind of bakes on there. So I actually have a rim of it at the top that's I want to say kind of permanently there unless I really, I don't know, take some magical WD-40 or maybe some rain and actually try to wipe it off. Um, I got a tactical trigger in here, extended Gen 3 mag release RTF2 frame, which is now my favorite. I don't really do stippled frames anymore. It is what my carry gun is. Um, but I, and I, the reason I like Gen 3 is obviously I can do RTF2, uh, but I also prefer the extended OEM, uh, extended Glock release uh, more than the aftermarkets out there. Uh, Tango down, slide lock just makes it a little bit easier, but stock's fine. I run stock slide locks. It's not really a big deal. Uh, and then I can run this X300 if I need to run a weapon light, which is what I was doing last night, or I can just run the gun like this. And then a Zev Mini Magwell, someone I saw asking, uh, Magwells on carry guns. The answer is absolutely. If you can get away with it, if you can conceal it, you have the right holster, the right shirt, the right whatever, absolutely. I definitely recommend Magwells just for the reason of, you know, a more consistent reload. It doesn't necessarily speed up your reload. Like the speed of your reload still comes down to how fast you're able to grab your magazine, insert it into the pistol. Uh, but what it actually does is it just creates uh, more consistency where if you're off by, you know, a few millimeters as you're indexing the magazine, that'll help redirect the magazine actually into the pistol. So what a lot of people find is because they have a mag well, they can force themselves to go faster because if they make a mistake, it'll correct itself. Uh, but the reality is you can still be really fast without a mag well. It just helps with some of the uh, inconsistency. But a fun fact, if you are running a suppressed Glock, what I really like about running a mag well is it really helps support the weight of the suppressor uh, because it really jams your hand all the way up into the gun. It also helps prevent the gun from kind of tipping down uh, because this is running up along your hand. So I actually really like running a Magwell, super specific little uh, note, I might add. But if I'm running a suppressor on here, I can shoot it one-handed a little more effectively having that Magwell on there. Since you're talking about suppressors, uh, threaded barrels, cans, what mount? Um, so so the, the funny thing with suppressors is suppressors on pistols are super overrated. Uh, they're not generally speaking very effective and one of the biggest issues is having suppressors that constantly spin off of your threaded barrel uh, which is one reason we are switching all of our threaded barrels on all of our guns to the uh, reverse thread so it's 13 by one and a half or one and a half by 13 whatever it is uh, the reason for that is you're obviously fighting against the uh, basically the twist of the bullet as it's coming out which is basically tightening the suppressor to the threaded barrel on a traditional half by 28 which is uh um, none of these actually. Are these all? Did these you are all. Switch them these, over? Are, these are all left hand, and these are actually the Glock OEMs because they have this nice little shelf, which also helps keep the suppressor on. Uh, but the biggest issue I was having, and this goes for a lot of people as well, because I get a lot of messages on it, is how do you keep your suppressor on your barrel tight? Well, if it's right, if it's half by twenty eight right hand thread, it's really hard to do that if you're doing high round count. If you're shooting a mag or two, it's fine. It's not too bad. Uh, but as soon as your can starts to twist off, I was finding massive POI shifts at even 10 yards, like off by many inches, 15 yards, even more, you know, 25, completely off target, like off to the side. And then it just starts to twist off more and it's a big problem. So reverse thread is what I'm starting to do more of. Uh, you just have to switch out your adapter in your suppressor, your piston kit, whatever, and then get the right barrel. These are all Glock OEMs, which are a little harder to find, um, but they actually work really well. And so when I swapped to this, I was able to do a 500, 500-ish rounds through it. I actually need to go this way. Um, and it didn't budge. It didn't move and my POI was good to go and I could shoot this out to 50 and it was set. So there we go. Where do we get those? Get what? 
Where do we get the OEM barrels? I'm not telling, because they're hard to find. <laughs> I don't, I think they're hard to find because Glock didn't make very many, because uh, this is a Glock barrel, because frankly, not a lot of people run suppressed pistols. And frankly, they're overrated, and I don't run them very often either. They're just not as... Yeah, you're going to run cool. around like the Joker from the Bat, uh, yeah. first Batman movie? I will say, though, Make that, thing that out of your pants. this is really easy to shoot one-handed with this <clears throat> mag roll right there. Just, oh man, this point's real nice. Um, here's really another slick. one. What is the most upgrade? What is the most upgrade for the shooter? Most important, I would imagine, upgrade. What skill first? Um, f uh, what I would suggest <laughs> is... Um, learning how to manipulate the trigger uh, properly, which for, for me that's going to be consistently, so it's the same every time, uh, so that I'm always in control of the trigger. Um, once you got that down, understand how to apply um, acceptable sight picture, and then work your grip. Uh, if you can get those three things down, the rest of it uh, is more or less a cakewalk. It's, uh, but those three things, uh, learn how to uh, control the trigger, Apply acceptable sight picture and make sure that you're you've got a consistent grip. Yep, that's more or less it. Um, I'd say trigger. I like I like changing my and we're talking Glocks here. I know some of you guys are asking. I have a, a few different pistols back here. I don't modify those a whole lot. I shoot a lot of those a little more stock than the Glocks. I've worked on Glocks a whole lot more. Um, I would say after weapon light. Uh, the things that I would modify, you know, if it's a Gen 4, is a uh, mag release. Uh, I have a hard time hitting a Gen 4 mag release every time. I can hit it, uh, but I prefer having 99.99% consistency. Uh, so I'll be able to go pretty fast while doing so. So I usually change out the mag release because that's something I need. Uh, some people, maybe because they have massive hands, need to change the slide release. Um, it kind of depends on what's going on with your hands and how big they are when it comes to actually manipulating the gun. Um, but yeah, for me, it's weapon light. And then my second upgrade would actually probably be a red dot. Um, if I already know how to shoot with irons and then after that, I'd probably go for like a trigger, maybe a mag well. Um, but I will say, cause there's probably been a few questions here about, um, you know, an aftermarket barrel, uh, not necessary, uh, at all buying an aftermarket barrel, unless you need threads for a suppressor or you're running a compensator. Reason being, most people are not going to outshoot the stock Glock barrel. I don't even think I'm going to outshoot the stock Glock barrel. Um, I've run the aftermarket accurized fancy whatever barrels. Um, those are obviously really big a couple years ago, and it did not greatly increase my shooting ability. Um, what it came down to was, you know, my trigger press and my consistent alignment of the sights, uh, not what fancy Gucci gold tin coated barrel that I had. So save 200 and whatever dollars. Don't get a barrel. Just run stock. That's what I've got in my, uh, there's my carry gun right here. I should, I was going to take the suppressor apart and make it small again because I actually don't like it when it's, you know, full size. But, uh, oh, actually it wasn't chambered. Okay, well, <laughs> good thing nothing happened. Uh, it's because I was running this the other day. But um, what I have on this guy is I have a stock barrel because I'm not going to outshoot this thing. Uh, then I've got an RM09, one MOA RMR, the new TLR7A, and uh, I'm set and I'm good to go. So, and this is a milled slide. I have stippling on here, but this gun right here actually is probably going to end up being my new carry gun here you do this. at some point I'm when I'm uh, when I'm ready. Do you, you, you think you're gonna break that? It's just not. I don't like the way it's feeling. So, <laughs> if if it breaks, it's on you. Um, are there different kinds of irons, or are they all basically the same? There are different types. There's different You've types. You've got like blacked out thing. front and rear. You've got square, you know, rear notch, U rear notch. You've got uh, tritty, tritium, the fiber or the fiber optic. Fiber, fibers are fiber good. front with a blacked out rear. There's yep. night sights with uh, the tritium. They all end up. Stuff. They all end up doing the same thing where you put the front sight in the valley and you shoot. There's a lot of preference. Some guys prefer blacked out rear versus a high vis front. Um, I definitely prefer that if I'm shooting straight up irons. Tritium is something that I believe is very overrated. If as soon as you activate a weapon light, you're not going to see them. Uh, the only time you're really going to see tritium is if that's all you have on the gun and the lighting conditions are absolutely perfect where you're in the dark, the suspect or the bad guy is in the light so that you can properly identify him and you've got everything going on where you can actually see perfect glowy tritium sights that are new. They're not past their half-life of like five years or whatever because they're radioactive. Um, so there's a lot of 
the stars really have to align for you to get the, the, the real benefit out of tritium sites, which is why a lot of guys don't really run them anymore. Uh, they were a big thing like, what, 10 years ago? Um, while, when everyone yeah. thought they were awesome. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if I run tritium and activate a weapon light, tritium's gone. I can't see it. Um, and that's why I prefer having like a fiber optic where that red will pop when I have some light above me or around me uh, or from my uh, weapon light. Uh, so I'd say ditch tritium. Don't even worry about it. I mean, that's uh, what I'm using on my 34. That's just an iron sight gun is the fiber optic yeah. front with a blacked out rear. In the daytime, uh, I can see a little bit of the flash of that red. My eyes are able to pick up, you know, alignment so I get a good sight picture good deal. Um, and then at night if I'm using a weapon light it's just a black yep. outline my favorite place. irons I don't have any here they're on a gun in there are the Ameriglow eye dots because I have a high vis orange front sight one tritium ampule and then the rear is just all blacked out actually no there's a tritium ampule in the bottom there so if for whatever reason I need to shoot that pistol under night vision I sort of still can but I mainly mm -hmm. run those sights for the blacked out rear and the bright orange high vis front sight um, and the only issue with tritium, or the big issue I would say, is the tritium can fall, oh, not tritium, uh, fiber. Uh, the fibers can fall out as it has on this gun because I haven't been running these irons, I've just been running dot. Uh, so this fiber optic actually fell out at some point uh, in the past few thousand rounds. Um, this guy's still there, but probably only for a little while. They wear out, they fall They're out. They're easy to replace though. They're easy to replace, but they <laughs> fall apart and fail more than a high-vis like Ameriglow front sight post will. Do you have one you so, want to do? Do I have one what? A question or is there? I don't, I'm, I'm just looking. I'm getting the suppressor back up and running. Uh, uh, yes, carry a gun with a light. The RMR is any weight. Yeah, RMR doesn't really add any weight. Um, I love it how, so actually let's talk about this real quick. Do I have, okay, I do. So a lot of people out there are like, well, I don't want to carry a dot because it's adding bulk and weight to the gun when I put it in my pants. Uh, well, not really, because it's still the same width as the gun itself, so you're not causing any concealment issues right there, even if you run it at 4 o'clock. And as far as weight goes, they only weigh a couple ounces, so it's not going to be a big deal. Um, optics don't impede concealed carry really at all. Uh, the big issue is you have to go find a holster that can actually uh, obviously fit that optic. This is a, a sidecar from us, of course. And uh, so this isn't causing any additional bulk at all. When it's actually on... <laughs> Just like this, the optic is basically facing towards the magazine and it's not causing any additional anything going on. Uh, so it doesn't change anything as far as carry goes. Yeah, you, uh, you may have to pay attention to what you know brightness setting it's on, uh, you know, when you get the gun set up, but other than that, it's not gonna change anything. Compensators and flat triggers. Flat triggers, again, it doesn't necessarily make you a better shooter. Uh, I know flat trigger companies love to talk about biomechanics and pulling the trigger. I've run flat triggers and I've found that they do different things to me. I go back to shooting stock. I shoot them fine. Uh, that's going to be a personal preference thing, I think, more than anything. Compensators, I again, I don't have one of my compensated pistols here. It's not over there. Oh, no, wait. Oh, my. I do have something that I haven't shown, but I may as well show it now because I have no idea when we're actually going to use it. Uh, speaking of compensators... So, uh, yeah, you guys know what this is. Uh, this is a custom comp that I made for this uh, P30L. Uh, compensators are super cool, but one of the biggest issues that I've actually seen uh, for folks running them is they start to get really soft and complacent. Uh, so if they take a compensator and throw it on this Glock, for example, I still see them shoot and the gun's still fishing around. Um, even though they have a compensator, which supposedly is supposed to help them a whole lot with recoil, uh, but what ends up happening is, is it starts, it allows them to loosen their grip and not fight the recoil as much, and then they gain no benefit from the compensator at all. The compensator really only starts to play a part if I'm still gripping the gun as if I didn't have the compensator, and I'm still fighting recoil as if I didn't have the compensator. Then I can start to gain some actual benefit from the compensator and how I actually shoot, like John Wick. Only he didn't have recoil because blanks. But uh, that's a big thing about compensators. They're not, as, they're not as cool or awesome as people like to think, and I usually see them hurting people uh, more than actually benefiting them. And I've never actually run this <laughs> pistol for anything, and I had that made forever ago. It's pretty cool, and it actually works. It actually works too well. I have to shoot, like, plus B ammo through it. So... Maybe someday I'll do a video on that. Maybe. Perhaps. All right. Why do you choose a one way RMR? Um, it's a little more refined if I want to dial it down, um, shoot a tiny bit more accurately because I don't have dot, a dot covering certain kinds of targets. 
Uh, but frankly, if I turn it up all the way, it ends up being big, like my 3M away. So it's really no different uh, running a 1M away. I know some people like to think it is. It's really not. Um, can you guys make a sidecar for... No, we won't do that for an air pistol. No. Uh, I carry six what? pistols. <laughs> I carry... I know, I hate comments now. I carry six pistols for CCW. Any tips? Uh, no. Uh, no tips for you. <laughs> Never. Um, dot size on red dot and Y. So there's obviously varying discussion on that. Red, these regular defensive red dots like the SROs, RMRs, Delta Points, they range in 1 to about 6. Um, they can go up to 12 with like the triangle. That starts to become an issue when you start shooting a little bit of distance or you start putting that dot on certain kinds of targets or certain target uh, exposures, certain di different things. Um, I recommend people stay in the 2 to 3 realm. Um, it allows you to get the dot nice and refined for night vision stuff if you ever do that. Uh, but also stay nice and refined for targets further away. Uh, six M away, it can work. I've run them, uh, but when I go to shoot 25, 30 yards or whatever, it starts to be you know a little more of an issue as far as covering the target up. And if I turn that dot up all the way on a cloudy day, let's say to all the way at max setting, that dot is quite a bit larger than a one M away red dot that I have turned up all the way. And since most people aren't always controlling the brightness of their dot, if I go to draw my one M away RMR on full brightness in this room, I would prefer that dot to be a little bit smaller than if this was a six M away on full brightness, which is gonna be huge and basically take up the entire glass. And so then I'm having to rely on basically a, my little RMR window full of light and putting that on something that's just not very accurate and it covers up the target. So In the, the few competitions that I've shot and I've used an RMR, I've noticed I, I need it like bright enough to where my eye will pick it up quick, but I noticed if I was running it too bright, um, I'm trying to get A zone hits on everything because I want to I want to do well and I want to do it fast, um, that if it was too bright, it would cover up more of the A zone at various you know distant tar distance targets. And uh, I would end up, you know, thinking that, hey, everything's lined up, good to go, pressing the shot. And in all reality, it's actually like yep. off right or left or high or low every once in a while. Yep. Um, and then also if we apply this to, like, say, a self-defense situation, you're not taking 100-yard shots with your handgun. That would be irresponsible anyway. Um, how small and refined do you actually need the dot, you know, at 10 feet? you know, 12 feet, you know, 10 yards. Or do you even need sights if you really know what you're doing at 10 feet? No. So, Here inside this room, I'm good just pointing the gun and, like, aligning it. I don't have to have a perfect sight picture. Um, all right, let's hit a couple questions super fast. Um, shoot. Uh, best rear sight shape. So I've run – there's obviously V-notch, U-notch, square notch. I personally prefer a square notch. I have a much easier time really knowing where the front sight needs to go. In a U shape, I've had issues kind of knowing exactly where my front sight is down in the corners or corners of the U shape because it doesn't have corners. I personally prefer a square shape because I can really tell what's going on at the front sight. Again, that's going to come down to user preference. Uh, some people prefer a U shape or a V shape or a V notch, whatever it's called. Uh, I prefer square because I because the front side is square and I can just line that all up. I'm dealing with straight angles and it's not like straight angle out here curvy angle back here with straight angles too like it's just a bunch of i don't know i'm not as big of a fan of it can i shoot still shoot a gun accurately with it yes um is it something i prefer doing no i prefer a square notch i don't know if that's necessarily best but it's definitely something that i prefer um best suppressor most quiet for 300 blackout oh that's completely different uh <laughs> I like the Surefire SPS 300. It's really good. This is not a rifle Q&A, but, you know, there you go. A little bonus. Um, what is your opinion on the Shield RMS Red Dot? So I haven't run one a lot. The cool thing with that is it will fit on smaller pistols, uh, like the Glock 43 and stuff like that. Uh, I haven't run one enough to know. It looks flimsy, uh, but it may be just fine, uh, especially for, like, concealed carry stuff where you're not, like, running around with a, you know, retention holster or an open holster. Um, but I haven't run those enough to really know about them. Uh, Drew's got one that he runs around with. Um, is it worth spending money on a brand name gun light? Yes, it is. Um, and you're probably talking about Surefire. Um, yes, they have very good durability. Uh, they cost what they cost for good reason. Surefire does charge for their name, absolutely. Probably a little more than they need to. Uh, but you are definitely getting what you pay for as far as reliability goes, lumens, uh, activation, how it mounts to the gun. Um, you definitely, uh, it's definitely a good purchase. Uh, when would we be ready to switch carry guns? So when I switch carry guns, because uh, I've done it a couple times now, and it's always been Glock 19s, um, I have to be really confident with the gun that I'm switching to that 
I've had enough time on the range, round count, and just running different drills that I'm confident with what's going on with the gun. Now, obviously, this is still a Glock 19. It's the same as my other one. Uh, but I really want to make sure there's nothing weird going on with the gun itself. Uh, I've actually had Glocks. I bought a Glock 19 a long time ago. Uh, the trigger housing was actually flawed, so the gun wouldn't... Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was doing, but it was a it was a major problem. It, it was actually a... I pulled another housing out, looked at them, and it was out of spec. So there's tolerance stacking or whatever. Uh, so I swapped that out. So to make a switch to a carry gun, I just want to get 500,000 rounds through it. 500 to 1,000, not 500,000. That would never happen. Uh, 500 to 1,000 rounds, a bunch of different drills, reps, dr draws from concealment, uh, reloads, make sure I'm consistent there uh, before I actually make the switch. And that's what this gun is supposed to be, and I just haven't had time uh, to mess with it. So I'm just going to keep uh, running what I have, which is fine. It's basically the same thing. It's not a big deal. Uh, what would you carry if Glock 19 didn't exist? Why don't you, you, know, why don't you take that? I'll answer it too, but I want to I curious to see things. If you can't carry a Glock, what you got? I don't know, honestly. It's the big, that's the <clears> question. I, uh, that's the question for us, not for other people necessarily, but. Uh, a what? Makarov. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. PBK. What was the, uh, there was, what was that, uh. And I've never even shot it. I've just held it around the shop. But uh, what's, what was it, a CZ or whatever you have? It's a P10. Nice. It's similar. <laughs> Supposedly a Glock killer, but it wasn't. Um, but so I've never shot the thing, so I don't... I mean, I yeah, can't. that shot nice. So for me, it's either... It would either be a 320. I know, funny, right? Uh, or it would be the m and 2 carry or compact. Which, say, yeah, whichever you, one is the Glock 19 one. And I was actually looking at... The 2.0. The 2.0, yeah, not the MMP original. The 2.0. But I can't remember but if it's the compact the or the carry. I would, um, I would, I would do run the, the standard size. I would do the short one because I'm skinny and you know it's hard to conceal things. Um, so I, that's what I would probably run. And I was actually watching a video from Brandon Wright this morning, watching him shoot his M and P uh, 2.0, and I was like, man, I kind of want to try some of those. So I may go buy a couple and build a couple out with dots and irons. Um, I've shot the 19 sized one a little bit, like a year ago, two years ago, and it did shoot really good. It's just something I need to shoot more. But it would either be that one. Or a 320 carry or compact, whichever. Uh, I like the the grip angle on 320 is nice. It does have some bore axis, but whatever. Um, dual illuminated RMR. Uh, it's not worth it. Uh, the issue with those RMRs is they add a lot more tint to the glass so that the dot is more visible. So it requires less juice. Um, and since they're auto, usually uh, you don't always have good control of the brightness of the optic, obviously. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of the dual illuminated RMRs. I prefer having full control over my dot, having a little bit less tint because it's battery power straight to the uh, you know emitter, straight to the glass, and uh, I'm good to go. So I don't recommend the dual the dual illuminated RMRs, not at all. Um, why don't you correct the narrative? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I'll show you narrative. Uh, let's see. Do you do your own sippling or outsource it? I have done it before. I'll never do it again. It wasn't great. I did it once myself one time. I think we've all done it. Uh, it was not great. I mean, it, yeah, wasn't, it wasn't horrible, but it wasn't great. Um, I've outsourced it, but now I just buy RTF2s or I just shoot stock like this one and I call it a day. I really don't worry about it anymore. I wish I wish but, I had brought a different gun today, but um, I this one hasn't been done yet, but Lead Baron, Lead Baron Customs, yeah, uh, Blake has done a lot of good, good work go. for myself and several other folk. But if you want to get something stipple then I would check him out. Uh, how many mags should I have on hand with pistol? Uh, I think for carry, I think one is a good idea. There's a couple reasons for that. One, if I have a catastrophic malfunction or my mag fails, which I will say has happened to me. Uh, I remember I was uh, I was about to leave to go somewhere, and I was checking I was checking my pistol and everything, and my Glock 19 magazine for whatever reason I think I was pulling it out or something, and I fumbled it and it fell on the ground, and the the uh, base plate just slipped right off and all the rounds just went and just like fell out. Um, and I've also had that before happen with an extended base pad in my pistol uh, fly off and all my rounds just dump onto the ground. So you can have mal uh, magazine malfunctions. Uh, so the last thing that I would want to do is I'm out doing something and all of a sudden that happens to me for whatever reason, like who knows what. Um, I like having a spare magazine on me for that or if I'm clearing a double feed or maybe I do use my pistol, and I simply want to top my gun off. Um, so I like having a spare magazine, but the other thing is, because I carry appendix, 
it's it helps me as far as concealment goes in having the spare magazine because it helps equal out the bulge of the gun. If I only have the gun on one side of me over here, it's a little more noticeable than if I have the spare magazine. So for me, that's another reason why I like having it, but it just gives me a little more capability for certain things. Obviously, I may not need it if I actually end up drawing my gun in a situation. Um, or I absolutely will have to have it. You know, It could go either way. Um, but I personally like having at least one. I know some guys who carry two or more, uh, but I like having one on me, especially if you carry a single stack. If you carry a single stack, you really should have another magazine because uh, you're presupposing that you your seven rounds of nine millimeter will be enough for at least one person. But if you've got two people or three people, well, it's, you're stacking a but lot of odds. If you're carrying God's suit. caliber, all you need is like one. Right? It shoots the guy halfway away. across the room. That's right, something like that. Uh, P365 upgrades. Don't know enough about 365 and their aftermarket upgrades to give you any information on that. I'm sorry. Isaac. XDM. No, that's got to be a sarcastic comment. What? How I'm... great the XD is. Talk about how great it is. No, 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 no. They're horrible. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're in, uh, <laughs> if you're in Croatia, give it a look. I love it. In Croatia, it's not called the XD. Well, see, the funny thing with the XD is the people that defend it are also, at least in my experience, have been the people that are like, America made by America, and I'm like, it's it's not an American gun. It's made in Croatia. Like, it's I, not American I, at all. I will say my XD45 is the fastest gun I ever sold. Not fast <laughs> enough to be a straw sale, <laughs> but the XD <laughs> is so. Thankfully, though, I will say, I think the XD has gone down in popularity from like five years ago, because that was like the gun seven, eight, six years ago. I, I felt no longer like, than that. Probably. Remember when it came out, I that's when I, to buy I, was, one. I was old enough to like do gun stuff. Back we had then, to dremel so. the feed ramp out of it just so it would actually cycle and feed the next round. Yeah, it fire, eject the casing, and then the feed yeah, ramp was so no, ridiculous no. that the it wouldn't it wouldn't feed. Not, not a good idea. Um, Olight, I'm not a huge fan uh, for a variety of reasons. Again, name brand lights are a good idea. We'll just we'll just we'll just say that we we'll don't talk about Olight too much. I know they're a huge topic on YouTube. Because of shills, but whatever. Um, you know, it is what it is. Desert Eagle for carry. Absolutely. Uh, actually, the Desert Eagle is a lot more pleasant to shoot than I thought it would be. Um, American made. Steyr M9. Interesting pistol. Are you shooting Memorial? I it's hope so. It's got triangle sights, I'm signed doesn't up. it? Uh, Steyr? It's got weird sights. It's got a weird thing going on with that <clears> gun. <throat> it's also got, it's a very aggressive grip angle, too. It's like, you're like pointing it like that. It's pretty wild. Uh, trigger upgrades for concealed carry or no. So let's talk about that real fast because obviously that's one of the big, bigger questions is it's optics and then triggers usually. It's this idea that if you modify your gun, the prosecutor is going to use it in court against you. And that's correct in some senses. So for example, if I were getting a shooting tomorrow and my gun is covered in Punisher skulls and it says death on it or I'm a killer or like a bunch of crazy stuff on the gun. It's true. That's probably not going to help me in court when the prosecutor steps up and wants to talk about how I train only to kill people and I want to kill people because my gun says it. And so it's kind of proof right there. Um, that's one reason why I think it's really important that people don't cover their guns in skulls and crazy sayings that are super aggressive because if they do get into a shooting, that could be used against them. However, if you modify your gun with a trigger, there's a couple ideas. One is they're going to argue you modified the trigger so that you can kill more effectively. Well, the counter argument to that is, no, I modified the trigger so that I can be more accountable for my shots by knowing when that wall is going to break and being more accurate. So there's always a way you can argue and articulate why you're doing a thing to the gun as long as you're not covering it in skulls. Just don't do that. Don't put Punisher skulls on your gun, but if you're making a modification that truly makes you more effective so that you can you know, prevent collateral damage from happening and only shoot you know, what needs to be shot, there are ways of articulating that, and that's why I don't think it's a problem and this is a big discussion online and with lawyers and stuff as far as like weapon upgrades go. Um, you know, upgrading your, your gun, provided it's practical and reasonable and you can, you know, argue it and explain it, go ahead. You know, um, same goes for like compensators. You can make the argument that you have a compensator so that you can be more accurate and more accountable for your rounds because there's less recoil so that the gun comes back on target and you can see your sights faster again. Um, there's lots of ways of articulating it, but yeah, I'd say for a carry gun, I have no problem carrying a modified carry gun provided... It's practical, it makes sense, I can argue it, and it's not crazy and doesn't make me look like I want to run around um, shooting people. You know, it's like putting all kinds of crazy sayings and skulls on it. So, but I'm not a lawyer, 
so take that for what it's worth. Um, let's see. I'm still going through. Wow, holy cow, that's a lot of questions. I feel like like Trout or something. Like who? No, you need a good hang on. Is that a video game reference? Yeah, it is. Hey, you got it. You got it. Yeah, <clears> yes, yeah. I couldn't he, tell you he which gets game a, it was. He gets a comment like every point zero one seconds. <clears throat> um... Uh, Hollow Sun, Pistol Red Dots. They have some new ones look really cool. Uh, I'm going to try them out. Uh, some of their older ones, they had so many different models and types. I, I wasn't interested, but they've got a, a couple new ones that are, look really promising. I think they're getting, I want to say some of their act together and trying to make them a little more, um, I guess, usable and or uh, durable and or user friendly. And, uh, you know, friendly going on to different plates and stuff. So I'm looking forward to trying a couple of those out. Best zero distance for red dot. Uh, we do 10 yards. You're still doing 10 yep, yards? 10. 10 yards. 10's good. I was doing 25. Um, honestly, either works. If you do a 25 yard zero, you're obviously good inside of that. If you do a 10, you're good all the way out to like 25 more. Uh, more. Um, the big one is your windage, making sure your windage is on because obviously your, your elevation is going to change per distance, obviously. I'm also if, fairly certain that, that 10 yards is also, I think, it was based Third. off like a 115 grain, 9 mil. Yeah, and I think it comes back still, down at like, is it 40 or 30 or something? I don't remember It's not exactly. bad. It's inside of handgun distance. Like, am I going to use my handgun at 100 yards? No. So as long as my windage is good to go and I'm not aiming here and my rounds are going here, uh, I'm happy. If they're a little high or a little low, my point of aim based on my zero yeah. distance, that's if you zero most likely your okay. handgun at 10, you should yeah. be... Maybe slightly impacting a little bit high at 25. Uh, but you should still be able to keep rounds within like the head box of an IPSC at 25, no problem. Yep. The big one is just making sure you're pressing the trigger properly. Yeah. That's that's the bigger concern than having the perfect. Like I used to want the perfect red dot zero, and I would sit there for like a hundred rounds trying to get the perfect zero. I don't do that anymore. I get it in the 10, and then I confirm on a gong, and I just draw on steel, and I'm like, if I can hit this little gong at 15 yards or whatever from the draw in you know, 1.2 seconds or whatever, my zero's fine. It's, anything beyond that is going to be me causing gross problems with my trigger finger um, or mistiming as I'm dragging the gun across on a transition. Um, as long as I've got stuff in this at you know 10 yards, it doesn't even have to be like that. As long as I'm consistent and good to go, I'll be fine on what I'm doing. So I, I try not to get too crazy with my zero as, um, and it's, it's been okay for me so far. Uh, you know, running steel out to 25, 30 plus nods, all that good stuff. Um, is it worth buying more expensive carry ammo? Yes. You should get good carry ammo that is, uh, uh, ballistically effective. Uh, lucky gunner had a really good ammo test where they took out a lot of ammo, shot a lot of ballistic gel. Uh, I have spear 124 grain hollow points. I know guys that just carry ball because they're like shot placements, all that matters. It's true. Uh, some rounds, though, can go through glass and windshields a little more easily, different like bonded rounds and stuff. And some of the newer 120, uh, some of the newer like 124 grain, 147 grain, 9 mil, um, they're seeing is actually uh, way more effective than some of the 40 rounds that guys were really, you know, uh, crazy over like eight years ago, seven years ago. So 9 mil has become the round because there's some really good defense rounds you can get for it. And the ball ammo is fine, too. I will say, back, back in the day, my, uh, my roommate shot a guy through our apartment door and went through the door, through the guy's hand, and then into the neighbor's door. So With a... It was 9 millimeter ball. So, so ball's if you're, you're going to use, you know, carry... I, I, I would I would suggest a good carry round. Yep. I would do your research and get a good carry round. The other what's the other big one? Uh, Hornady. Not Horn, yeah, is that Hornady? They're 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 both. There's Hornady, Federal, and Spear. I think are the those like are kind the of main big ones. three yeah. that you kind of see. I try not to get too nerdy. You can get really nerdy on ammo. Like, you get very nerdy. Really, especially rifle pistol. It's like okay, nerd levels like this. Rifle ammo. It's like nerd levels like up to like here. Um, so I try not to get too crazy into the different ammo. How can I keep my head up while shooting and not turtle? Um, dry fire will help a lot and uh, you can start with press outs. Um, just bring the gun into here. Be mindful of keeping your head up, keeping your eyes where you want to shoot. Have a little spot on the wall you can tape out with some painter's tape and just lift the gun to your eyes. Present the gun straight out and flat, bring it to your eyes and just rep that out. Uh, build that new pathway yep. of doing that task and and there's no need to sit here and yeah there is a fast, now there, there is a fun trick if you want to if you if you really want to hit it hard you could put a neck brace on so kind <laughs> no kind of 
you take iPro, clear iPro, and you tape the tops of it. Because normally when guys turtle, they're seeing the sights with the very top of their eyebrows, like with their eyes all the way up here. So if you actually tape the above part of your, your clear eye pro, it actually forces your head to come up to here, and that actually ends up forcing the gun to come up. Now you obviously still don't want to lock out your elbows. Um, I recommend doing what Steve just described, where I literally stand there like I normally do, like a normal human being or a normal robot, and I literally drive the gun up like this without moving my head. Without moving my head. And I have a bend in the elbows. I'm not trying to lock out because I can't. It's really hard to align the sides of my head upright like that. I'm just staying nice and loose, elbows, arms bent, my head in the exact same spot as I normally am, presenting the sights, just like that. Uh, one other thing, just to be mindful of, is when you present, try not to get a bunch of tension and lift your shoulders up, So, because as you're bringing that gun up, if I start to tense my shoulders, the front of the gun, like that, do that. that angle's gonna be different. And if I drop my shoulders, Again, the angle is going to change, so now there's more adjustment need to be made as the gun comes out. So if I keep the shoulders relaxed, keep my head up, press the gun straight out, I'll be able to keep it on that plane. Okay, the rain's hitting me. I'm good to go. Woo! HSTs. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Federal yeah, HSTs. Yeah, that's what I've got. Yep, yep, yep. Um, critical defense. A Hornady critical defense, I think is what it is. Yep. That's it. Um, yeah, lots of the same questions. There are a lot of questions on the P365. Um, I actually need to take that gun out and run it. Um, it's definitely a, one of the cooler, slim 9 mil guns. They had some issues with it right off the bat, but <laughs> SIG basically always does. Uh, so it's nice. They fix the problems. Cool. Um, but that's a gun that I need to shoot more of, and I think they just recently released the XL, which is a longer slide version. I think it still takes the same mags, right, Isaac? Uh, yes. Yeah, same mags. mags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know more about that gun than I do, actually. Well, the other thing that people are going to ask about is... Uh, the mags. The, the 48, the Glock 48, comes with an aftermarket mag now, which hold 15 rounds. So once you Is get that one of the arms, ones you sent, right? Yeah. yeah. Sealed arms, so, so then you've got block 19 capacity in a much smaller gun. Which is cool. Although I will say, the issue with going with these smaller guns, obviously you can seal it easier. They are a little harder to shoot. They're usually more snappy. There's less mass to absorb the recoil. Uh, so when I've shot the 48, it shot really nice, but I'm still going to take this because it shoots a lot easier and will shoot a lot easier for people with less training. Mm -hmm. If you hand someone with less training a tiny gun who doesn't know how to control recoil, that's going to be way more problematic than handing them something like this. Um, they gain a lot more benefit running a larger pistol, uh, like a 17 or a 19. Um, you know, even with the women that I've shot with who have like small hands and are like, oh, I need a small gun. I hand them a Glock 19, they shoot it fine. Um, the whole idea of like, I need a gun that fits in my hands just right and perfectly, like, not necessarily, not really. Now, obviously, if your hands are so small that you can't pull the trigger, okay, now we have a problem if you can't even reach it. Um, but in my experience, working with people with smaller hands, even when I hand them something like this, which I might add, the Glock has a extraordinarily large grip. They have this massive space back here for bubble gum that you can stick back in here. And that actually is, in my opinion, a bit of a problem. Uh, I don't even like how these feel in my hand. I can't grip these as well as like an M&P, uh, but I still run these just fine. And I still run them a lot and it's not a big deal. I think people should get over the whole feeling thing like what does my heart feel like like no don't do that have no emotions um but yeah just grip the gun you know if it's a glock doesn't feel real good uh get on the trigger appropriately uh using the uh flat part of your finger don't put it in the knuckle don't put it on the very tip and just pull the trigger straight to the rear uh whether you have you know whether you have small hands or big hands and you're good to go now one cool thing about so. the glock 48 is in the future maybe someday if we talk about it enough it will have a light rail well, no, it won't matter. Glock will be like, no, nah, we don't want to help people. Like, we're not going to do that. They'll or, put it on a 22 three years, long so rifle pistol version, but then they won't. They'll do it in three years and say it's revolutionary, even though everyone is already doing I short pick guns. About it a bunch. Talk about then it. they won't want to do it. They want it, they want it to be their idea, kind of like how I want things to be my idea. Well, they've already no. made it, and it's already for sale in Europe. So we just have to... Get them to put it to the... That's true. American like the Glock 25 market. in Brazil. Yeah, kind of, sort of. It's a single stack 380. It's, a 380. it's only in Brazil, well, or South America. I think it's Brazil specifically. Okay. I'm not. I can't remember. Um, uh, Security nine. That's a Ruger, right? Yeah. Don't do that. Don't don't buy one of those. Um, can um, can I shoot off left shoulder from right handed? Yeah. So I have a video on that on YouTube. How to shoot if you're cross eye dominant. I'd say go watch that. I'm cross eye dominant, so I'm right handed, left eye. 
Um, so one thought process out there is, well, you have to shoot with whatever hand your eye is dominant as. No, you don't, especially if you're shooting a handgun. I take my handgun, I simply turn my head so that my dominant eye is centered with my body, and I present the gun. And I'm seeing the front sight with my dominant eye in front. So my non-dominant eye is kind of off to the side, so I can channel all the data into this eye facing this way, and I'm good to go, and I'm fine. And as far as natural point of aim, I still have that. Some people say you have to keep your nose in front of you for your natural point of aim. No, I can still natural, naturally point of aim just fine, tilting my head off to the side. Uh, just take some training. There are some benefits to being cross-eyed dominant, staying on my right shoulder when I'm shooting. My right eye picks up the red dot, but my left eye, which is effectively seeing and processing more data because it's my dominant eye, is able to see the target and around the target better than if I'm right eye dominant. Downside is if I go to shoot magnified with my right eye, I have to shut my left eye because it's really hard to control the data coming in when it's prioritizing this eye, but the magnification's on this eye, um, you, but you can do it. Uh, you don't have to switch shoulders to your dominant eye. Uh, you can make it work, especially if you're shooting a handgun. So, uh, Glock 44 is just perfection. I haven't even shot one yet. Um, so, I don't know. I wouldn't know about that. But 22 pistols are really awesome, though. I, I got one. You got one? Go ahead. How important is it for instructors to be mill LE dudes with I'll, combat experience? I'll let you cover that. <laughs> um, I will say this. Regardless of the topic that you are seeking instruction in, um, does that instructor possess you know or own knowledge meaning he can perform the task well and consistently and repeatedly can that instructor take an idea or a process or a thought convey that to the student in a manner that the student can uh, uh, absorb that information mm -hmm. understand it and then in turn apply it you know making that information now there so there's like information transfer um, I don't think it is necessary uh, for someone to have had combat experience, mill or, or you know, law enforcement. Um, <coughs> it's it can be a benefit. It, it for can be things. it can be value added, yep. obviously. But if if that is your only like, is this person someone I should take a class from? Do they have combat experience? And you can't check that box. Um, I, I I think there's more. There, there should be there's more important or more. What's the word I'm looking for? Relevant needs. Relevant maybe. needs, you know, um, yeah, for for the instructor, like communication, being able to, you know, talk about it, be able to do it, uh, and be able to pass that information on to to a student. Yeah, it also comes down to, and this has been a big cultural shift that I've seen in the past five or six years of doing this. Like, what is the information you're trying to get from the instructor? If you're going to learn how to shoot. Do you absolutely need a guy who did a military job or shooting is 1% of the job where being in the military or being in special operations or whatever is about so much more stuff than shooting? Like, do you really want to go to that guy for shooting if you're going after the shooting part? Like, if you want the shooting part, wouldn't it be better to go to someone whose life is 30% shooting or 50% shooting or maybe 100% shooting? All they do is shoot. I would rather go to that person if I'm trying to get the shooting part. Now, if I'm trying to get the CQB or the tactics or the logistics part, that's when I start, this is uh, for me speaking, for the kinds of instructors I look for, that's when I start to go look for the guys that specialize in those areas. And I think a lot of people think they can take an instructor who's been good at everything and they can just go to that one guy for everything. And the fact of the matter is, it doesn't really work like that. You have to go to instructors that specialize in their own realms. If you, I want someone who's gonna teach me driving, I don't go to an SF dude, I go to a professional driver who's on a track all the time doing stuff. And those are the guys that get contracted to help special operations guys with their driving. If I wanna take a class on shooting, I go to JJ Rakaza or some competition mm -hmm. shooter. If I wanna take a class on CQB, that's when I go to some SF dude, some guy who's been on a lot of hits, or maybe a law enforcement guy who's done you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reps of room clearing on a high tempo team. There's also a lot of stuff people don't understand about that where just because someone's SWAT doesn't mean they were on a high tempo team. They might've been low tempo. They might've been in this area. They might've had this kind of leadership. Experience varies greatly in military and law enforcement and for civilians as well. Um, I think more people need to have the understanding of just because someone did this doesn't mean they're an expert at this thing over here. They may have been an expert in this thing over here, and that's what I want to go to them for. And that just comes down to what you're looking for 
And then who's the best person you can find to give you that thing that you're trying to look for? Now with, you know, since it, to me that that's more of the, okay, we talk about real world experience, uh, you know, within whatever task it is that you're, you're looking for instruction in, um, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just, you know, related to shooting, but um, where life experience can have value added uh, with instructors is, I, I think it helps, uh, you know, in the positive side to where that person can take, you know, explain what we're doing, why we're doing, or how we're doing it, and then explain to you why they can, they can relate it. Uh, they have a little bit more information uh, at their disposal through personal experience to to then take uh, and, and translate the why. Um, and I think that that is helpful um, in, you know, in, yeah. in some cases. Yeah. Um, <laughs> appendix or strong side? All depends on what you're doing. I find it's easier for me to conceal carry with all my different, which isn't very much, I pretty much just wear the same clothes over and over. Um, it's way easier for me to conceal carry in uh, appendix uh, throughout the year than it is to do something out here. Uh, to do something at four o'clock or even uh, you know straight up at three o'clock, I've gotta wear some form of jacket or a really loose shirt. Uh, but being able to wear appendix, I can run, you know, I can just not run, shoot, I didn't wanna say that. I don't wanna be too tactical in my language. Uh, I run these hands, and uh, what shoes do I run? Yeah, I run this this uh, the research uh, fleece. But uh, appendix allows me to get away with concealing that gun with basically any of my clothes. I'm not having to strictly wear certain things, and I don't like having to do that. Um, so whether it's a t-shirt or a polo or a button down or a fleece or a whatever, I'm good to go. But carrying at three or four o'clock, at least in my experience of trying to do it and conceal it and get away with it, I have to be way more cognizant of mm. there's another tactical word for you guys um of what i'm wearing and i don't like that if i'm going to come out here to the facility or go to the range or go out in public somewhere i don't like to have to be like oh what shirt do i wear to conceal and what gun and what holster like, no i literally put on the same holster that i wear all week and then i put on whatever shirt i need to based on what temperature or how formal or fancy or whatever and i'm done and that's what mm. i like about a penix carry uh plus it is pretty comfortable once you get used to it um, it's easier to sit in the car, you know, running four o'clock, sitting down with your seatbelt and everything. Uh, it's not great, small, the back, horrible. Uh, but appendix is good to go for basically everything except for like tying my shoes. Then it's kind of a problem. But right now I can't even feel it. Like I'm good to go. If I think about it, I can feel the magazine some, but I'm good to go. I'm fine. So yeah, we'll move on. Appendix is best. I think appendix is really good. I, I wouldn't say it's best because if you if you have a home equality to you, uh, it may not be best. Uh, four o'clock may be a little bit better, uh, but I do think it has a lot of advantages. So, um, how do you feel about the MP 2.0? I like it a lot. Talked about it earlier. Uh, I need to run it more. I'm going to order a couple. Mess with them. Uh, yeah, I can slab squat. Yeah, absolutely, I can. You can what? Slab squat. Heels on the ground, comrade oh. found. <clears throat> Heels in the sky, western spy. Uh, yeah. Do um, you think uh, silencers are worth the hassle? I think they're absolutely worth the hassle for at least one. Uh, I say that for cultural desensitization. I think it is important when you go to gun ranges, if people demand paperwork, obviously you can go, here's the paperwork, I do have this suppressor. Um, so I do think it's important that people get at least one suppressor uh, so that they can start you know, doing their part in making suppressors more normal so that maybe in five or 10 years we can get the uh, NFA repealed or at least suppressors uh, removed from the list. Um, that would be nice. It, pistol cans though, I'd say no. Um, I don't really think pistol cans are worth it unless you really know what you wanna do with it. Um, they're usually the suppressor most people regret buying. Uh, that's not a suppressor I regret buying, but I'm kind of stuck with it. Reselling suppressors isn't really a thing. I'm kind of stuck with that guy. It's used. Um, yeah, it's used too. Like I'll, I'll run it here and there, uh, but if, if I can only own one suppressor, it's going to be a rifle can, probably a 7.62, so I can run 300, 308, 5.56, um, and I'm set. So get one, absolutely. Uh, and the wait time is about five months right now, I think. <clears throat> Something like that. What? That's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so moving on, uh, <laughs> Glock 45, uh, same as a Glock 19. Uh, actually, yeah, real fast on that, because I saw a few questions. Glock 45, Gen 5, 19, whatever, they're all the same. They all shoot 9mm, 
Maybe they got a grip that's a little longer, a little shorter. They're all the same. Now but this one's tan. That one's tan, so you get plus tan to shooting ability, whatever. I will say though, if you're a lefty, I would buy a Gen 5 if I was a lefty, but I don't own any Gen 5s because I haven't needed to upgrade to a Gen 5. Um, the only reason I would run a Gen 5 is if I was lefty because then you have the slide release on this side of the gun, uh, on the opposite side. Uh, but other than that, if you are buying a Glock for the first time, just get a Gen 4. It'll be cheaper or a Gen 3 or a police trade-in, you know, 380 yeah, bucks. This. That's why I have it. Yeah, just go get, is that a technical Gen 5? Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so you got the slide lock on this side, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're a lefty, have at it, get a Gen 5. If you're buying your first Glock, don't bother. Uh, it's the exact same as a Gen 4. It's going to shoot the same. It's a 9mm Glock that takes a double stack magazine with a light rail. It's the same. It's the same gun. They're all the same. Like, it's a Glock. Whatever. Um, so, yeah. Experience the STI. I've got one. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show this real quick. But uh, I don't have a ton of experience with them. Um, like some folks, I usually stick to shooting Glocks. But this is, a, as far as pistol upgrades... Uh, it's probably a good good gun to end on, but um, this is obviously you can start with you know stock gun over here, you know striker fired, you know uh, normal service duty gun, and then you can go all the way up to here. This is an SDI Open 2011 with customized everything. Well, this is our out of the box gun, but then I had a a friend modify it more for me with a frame mounted Delta Point, a four pound, three and a half pound. Actually, this is a three yeah three and a half pound trigger. It got a little heavier. Um, and then I can run a 26 uh, round magazine, 28 round magazine, whatever it is. And this gun shoots really nice, really flat, and it weighs like three pounds. Um, so that is sort of the, the high end as far as pistol upgrades go. And then a stock gun is kind of at the bottom. So this is kind of the spread that you will be upgrading your pistols. Yeah, this is a spread you'll be upgrading your pistols inside of. Those guns are really fun. They're really cool. Um, I would never carry that. Uh, for obvious reasons, it's big. I wouldn't be able to run a holster for it. It's a custom one I made for myself a long time ago. Um, but I still stick to these, even when I go to the range. Like, I have an option of shooting this guy, shooting that guy. I stick to shooting this guy. Uh, more relevant for, you know, teaching people and running stuff and my carry gun um, than this guy right here. I really never shoot this guy. I honestly should get rid of it, but I, I probably can't. But I don't know. Shooting this with night vision, that was a lot of fun because it just sits there and just, you know, it's good to go. So, yeah. But anyway, guys, uh, we'll probably uh, close out there um, just to be able to hit some of your questions. We'll be doing another live next Wednesday. Who knows what it's going to be about. Sometimes we know, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't know until the day before. Uh, it's kind of how we roll with these different things. I want to try to get a few more questions this time um, you know, versus just going on and on about different things. And then we try to do that. Steve does uh, lives. What's your Instagram? Uh, Pinkman83. What, what is yeah. it? Pinkman.83. Hit me 83. up on Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> hit him up on Instagram. He does lives. Are we doing here. that? Click does the like questions. button and follow no, and share. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, mine is Lucas Trex Arms. I do lives a lot less now than I used to. A couple a week, maybe I'll do one tonight. Don't Wait, know. Is this T Rex Possibly. Arms or Trex Arms? What? Where either, have I been working the either, last few either. years? Either, either. I, I say Trex sometimes. No, you it's don't easier. do a live tonight. I've got to do a live tonight. If I do, a, if you do one, then uh, I'll do mine after you or before. I don't know. We'll see how I feel. But if you guys want to get more questions answered, talk to us more about guns, or talk to Steve more, that's one area where you can find him. Uh, we'll keep doing YouTube lives here, trying to answer questions, talk about different things, go over different setups and guns. We've got a couple YouTube videos uh, that are pretty fun that we're working on right now. Uh, one, actually, a uh, little teaser is titled, How to Shoot a Handgun in 10 Minutes. It was actually one of the harder videos that I filmed, and there's some stuff in there you guys will probably think, like, oh, you should have talked about this thing. And it's like, well, I only have 10 minutes. I really have to condense it and keep it to the basics. It's a and really. Take. Yeah, really just get it out there for folks. So we're working on that right now. That should be dropping soon. Super concise, you know, trigger sights, grip, a couple other things. Um, that's sort of uh, tailored more to new shooters. Uh, but there's probably some stuff in there that some of you guys who've shot for a while may get something from. And it is in 10 minutes. It's like 10 minutes and 20 seconds, something like that, 10, 10 or something like that. So it was pretty, pretty difficult, but it was good. So, guys, uh, thanks so much. Take care, and uh, we'll see you, we'll see you around.